You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 206. Do or do not. There is no try. Yoda. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by screenwriting software, Arc Studio. Now, Arc Studio is easy to use, rock solid, and covers the whole flow. Structure, writing, rewriting, exchanging notes with partners, and so much more. It's also great for collaboration and writer's rooms. For example, it's been used in the writer's room of Arcane, the hit Netflix show. Now, if you want to check this out for free, all you got to do is go to arcstudiopro.com and sign up. But because you are listening to this episode, you're going to get $30 off all of their paid plans. So check out arcstudiopro.com forward slash bulletproof to see why they are taking Hollywood by storm. That's arcstudiopro.com forward slash bulletproof. Well, guys, today on the show, we have writer-director Sarah Elizabeth Mintz. And Sarah's new film, Good Girl Jane, is premiering at this year's Tribeca Film Festival. Her journey of writing and directing her first feature is pretty remarkable, and she has a plenty of shrapnel along the way that she tells us all about. She had the remarkable opportunity to assist Alejandro Rutu on The Revenant and the stories that she told about what was going on behind the scenes, watching a master like that work. She was on the set of the first season of True Detective, helping the director and creator there, and so, so much more. It's a fascinating conversation on not only how she got to her movie, but then also the making, the insanity of making her film Good Girl Jane and how she got it all off the ground and the writing process and everything in between. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Sarah Elizabeth Mintz. I'd like to welcome to the show, Sarah Elizabeth Mintz. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm I'm excited to talk to you about your your new film, Good Girl Jane, and and your your adventures in the film industry, which have have been you've got some shrapnel uh, along the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. This is not my first rodeo. It is my first feature that I've written and directed. But you've been, but you've been, uh, you've, you've been in some battlegrounds over the years. So we're going to get into that. So before we get started, how did you, and why God's Green Earth, did you want to get into this insanity called the film industry? Um, what, just jumping right in, right? Uh, <laughs> so, like, I don't know if I really had a choice in the matter exactly. <clears throat> Actually. I, I thought I just loved movies. And when I was in high school, I would, you know, do the thing where you like buy a PG ticket and sneak into the movies. I think it was like 2002, 2003, I really started sneaking into all the movies. Um, mm-hmm. I remember I, I was, it was like the dreamers came out. It was like, Oh, Bertolucci, like, that's so cool. It's like 13. Um, and ghost world, and, like Hedwig and the angry inch. Like I was, it, I was a teenager and I was like, I would have spent all my time watching like the weird movies that, um, that are at the, the Lemley, which was like the art house theater by my house. And um, so at first I just thought I was like a fan <laughs> and, and I was kind of shy. Uh, I was pretty shy actually. So 
I spent all my time watching movies like all night and I like, didn't sleep and would go to class and just like super tired. But I was like, well, I spent all night hanging with my friends, you know, on the street. So um, I think that I, I thought I was just a fan and I also didn't really know that women directed. Like there were very, there were very few female directors that I was aware of. I was aware of like Catherine Bigelow and Sofia Coppola. And truly, I think that was it. Like, luckily later I was like, oh, Andrea Arnold. Like slowly people started tri trickling in. Um, but I, I didn't know that was an option at all. I did grow up in LA. I did grow up, you know, around people that wanted to act or like people's parents were in Hollywood. But my family wasn't at all in, um, in the film business at all in the film business at all. No, my mom's a therapist. My dad was, he was in entertainment. He was um, a talent manager for musicians, but not, not different, super different world, yeah. but different. different crazy, but similar worlds. Yeah. Different crazy, exactly. but similar worlds. Definitely <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I was around the crazy, but not quite the film crazy. And then um, I went to college. I went to UW Madison for a year and a half, and I studied um, Russian language and political science. And I woke up one morning in sophomore year, and I was taking all film classes. It like happened really slowly, sort of overnight. And I was like, I'm not gonna be able to graduate. Like <laughs> I'm not. This isn't my major. I can't like figure this out. So I transferred to NYU. And once I was at NYU, um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna direct but it was it didn't happen overnight I didn't feel like it was an active choice in that it just sort of like it was always where I was headed it was always you were, the you were being option. pulled you were being pulled into that into that world regardless of whether you wanted to it was like a vortex like a black hole yeah it was just sucking you in that is, the that is the feeling that many filmmakers have it's just like I worked in a video store back in the day. So I was, you know, surrounded by, and then one day I said, what am I going to do? Worthy. <laughs> and, then, and I just looked, I said, um, I guess I'm going to direct movies. And that's literally how I got my start as well. It's just something that, and then once you're in, once you get bitten by that bug, I call it the beautiful illness. You can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of this the feeling of wanting to, as much as you might want to, to leave. Yeah. If you it's so hard. how to get rid of this, Bug, you're talking about? Please give me a call. You have, you now have my number. Like, <laughs> because, no, it's, I, <laughs> no, it's it's true. And I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to so many filmmakers over the years, and and everyone suffers from the same illness. All of us, all of us suffer the same thing. And there's no way out. And many of us have tried to leave, and many of us wanted to leave. I've tried to leave. I've been doing this for almost thirty years now, and I I've wanted to leave multiple times because it's just so hard. It's just so brutally hard over the years and it's that insanity that keeps you going <laughs> that makes you think that you're like yeah i can make this happen yeah i can get the financing yeah i can cast that actor yeah i can get into this festival it's it's insane <laughs> it, it really is and um i'm not trying to pivot prematurely but sure. this the movie that i the good girl jane is it tackles uh substance abuse and drug addiction and i definitely think <laughs> there's a lot of that in in pursuing a career like this like mm -hmm. that sort of i mean the highs and lows it's just it really mirrors like <laughs> like a, any addiction it really does it's, it's not you're not wrong you're not wrong i mean uh i mean i have been around the block a couple more times than you have but i've seen it as well with young and old it is that kind of addiction to it you just have to kind of keep going, you wake up in the morning thinking about it, you go to sleep at night thinking about it. It is, it is, it, it's all encompassing, but that is art. That is an artist's life. And for better or worse, that's why we were put here. <laughs> we have to, we yeah. have to walk this, we, we have to walk this path without question. Now was, you were talking about a few films. Was there a movie that specifically lit your fuse? Mm. Some of those movies that I listed earlier, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Iti Mama Tambien, I probably, that's probably the movie that I watched like on a loop freshman year, like when I was like 14, 15. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the youthful energy and like that 
the the verite the verite vibe in that film. I that was new to me. I like hadn't really seen anything like that before. It was also sexy, and I was like, you know, a teenager. I just loved that movie so mm-hmm. much. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And that, uh, yeah, probably that one, but also Hedwig and the Angry Inch. I have to say that movie really did change my life because it was the first time that I saw a film where it felt like anything was possible. Like you can tell any vulnerable story you want. Like there are no restrictions. Just <laughs> just tell your truth, like get it out there. And that, that movie changed my life. Like John Cameron Mitchell was my favorite director for a long time when I was, um, when I was younger because of his bravery and and that's inspiring to me oh no there's no question once you see that movie you go yeah oh yeah you can tell any story that is anything yeah, anything like if, this is, if this is if this has been if, if this has been put into the world <laughs> the door has been swung wide open anyone can walk through <laughs> so many yeah, absolutely so even if it's not even if that film didn't look exactly like the films i i knew i wanted right. to make it it yeah it changed my whole life it was like oh you could do anything so uh, while you were at uh, NYU, you made a short film called Transit, and it starred a young Dakota Johnson who was still a seasoned actor at that point. She 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 hadn't hit fit, uh, f- uh, what is it the, the gray she had Fifty Shades of Gray yet. No, no, she was on Ben and Kate, which was a Fox sitcom at the time. Right, but she was were a working actor. So uh, yeah. you know, for a young director like yourself at the time, what was it like? Working with a seasoned actor, how did you approach that process? Because I know a lot of filmmakers, young filmmakers listening, that they get an opportunity to work with a, a seasoned actor. And I remember when I, most of the actors I worked with growing up were not seasoned. They were young kids like me trying to make it happen. But when you get in a room or get on a set with a real a real actor <laughs> who was, who's got some I chops, <laughs> when you got some chops, it can be intimidating. Yeah a filmmaker um or it could be exhilarating how was it for you and how did you approach working with her well i have to be completely honest so i made that film like about a decade ago and this is really the first conversation uh this is the first press i've ever done for it because that film it did jumpstart my career in a lot of ways and and i did work with you know some really talented actors dakota included i i did that movie with her and that was like gigantic for me um but it didn't do a big festival run and it didn't do a big press tour so it's like whoa okay transit like take that back um (laughs) working with dakota i mean so i went to high school with dakota and and we were we were close and I knew her and um, her family and um, she had seen me go through a lot of the coming age that I coming of age that I was trying to like capture in that film and you're and she was one of the only actresses that I knew that I that I could ask to do it like I was like okay this is a close friend of mine she is clearly like I had a hunch about her you know when I was little she wanted to act and I was like okay this person is so talented and they're gonna act and like I got to get in there and work with her. And we just cared about each other. We crafted a story that was, again, very personal. Um, and it was it was a little intimidating, even like asking her to do it, even though we were friendly. Because I remember I took her to the Greenwich Hotel and I, <laughs> I had like $4 to my name. I took her to the Greenwich Hotel and I was like, let's get, you know, like a drink. Yeah. Uh, and I... And even just in that meeting, I remember thinking to myself, like, she's been in so many more of these meetings than I have. And I was really trying to put like some shoulder pads on and like pitch the film to her in a professional way. And anyway, (laughs) grateful to her. She decided to do it with me. She trusted me. And it was a really fruitful, like that movie, even though, uh, you know, it's definitely a student film and it's not like my finest work yet. Sure, of course. Really, it's something that I'm very proud of and I'm proud of what she gave in that film and it was it was a really it was very uh it was dramatic and personal for her too like there was a lot of stuff that i think she hadn't quite put on screen yet at the time and it was moving to to dig that deep with her and do that 
Now, I wanted to bring that up because so many filmmakers, you know, it's all great and dandy when you're when you're making it and you're at Tribeca and you're at Sundance. But to go back to those first days, you know, working on those first short films, that's when a lot of these lessons, the foundation, the bricks of the foundation are starting to be poured or the cement is starting to be poured in that foundation during yeah. those early short films. And getting an opportunity to work with Dakota, someone like uh, of her caliber, of her talent, uh, is a, a blessing and also, I'm sure, a learning experience as a director. It absolutely was. And I, I really, I did study her on that set because she grew up on set and I did it oh, yeah. right. and her, and you know, she, she was always on time. She was always so friendly to the cast and crew, really collaborative, but it was also just like, um, I felt like I really needed to, to, I keep saying this, um, but like, I really need to do my homework in order to like have conversation with her on set I couldn't just wing it because she had done the homework and um I did my first uh, I directed my first love scene on that short it was like very quick and it wasn't really graphic but I had to really make a safe space and a safe set for Mm -hmm. for everyone and it's actually um I worked with the same cinematographer on that short as I did on Good Girl Jane the Future Nice. So you brought, so you brought them along. You brought everyone yeah. along with you. And no, that, it's, that idea of safety. Yeah. You know, no, absolutely. I mean, I, anytime I've ever had to shoot a love scene, it is horrible. And it's horrible for everybody involved. It's not sexy at all. It's just about trying to keep a safe space and uh, for the yeah. actors. And, but it's just like, it's uncomfortable. Like as a director, you're like, all right, can you caress the back of the neck more here? And, like, it's just weird. It's a weird, unsexy awkward scenario to do yeah absolutely I mean I had no idea and I remember both actors I was working with in that scene had done love scenes prior and they were definitely like oh like (laughs) they knew how it went but I really had to go in there and be like okay I need to choreograph this ahead of time and be very clear on what I need so that they're not just like uh uh you know and and you're right, it's not really a sexy time. The whole point is just that you need to make sure these people feel comfortable and safe and really be clear about what it is that you want. And now we have these, you know, intimacy coordinators that are right. on all this stuff. And you gotta say that's profoundly helpful. Very, very profoundly With helpful. With the awkwardness. With the yes, absolutely. Just having a, a middle person to just kind of talk to somebody and go please help. I, I don't know. Yeah. How, what do I do here? <laughs> this is yeah. so awkward. <laughs> now, yeah. you also, like, but yeah, no, so you also, the, go ahead, go ahead. You want to, you want to make sure that it doesn't look like they're, you know, playing twister, like the angles really <laughs> matter. And these people help to give you that insight. Sorry, that's not very important, but no, I, no, I think it's, it's funny. It is. It's funny. It's kind of the lunacy of the the carnival that is filmmaking. You know, we are carnies. We're just carnies. You know, that's all we are, (laughs) without question. Now, you you had the you've had uh, the opportunity to work with some very interesting people over the years Uh, as Mm -hmm. you were coming up as a director. Specifically, you got to assist Alejandro Irutu on The Revenant. What the hell was that like? Because all I've heard is I've heard I've worked with I've talked to some people who worked on the movie. I've seen the documentary. I've heard heard stories. It was an insanity from what I heard on set in a good way, but just the nature of the kind of storytelling. You were there assisting him at that. Pro- were you on set? Did you were you did you watch what was going on? What did you learn? Tell me. Tell me everything. <laughs> um, wow. So. I was on that job in total, I think like three months. So I was not there as long as any, anyone else. I, I like, I came in near the end. Um, there was quite a, there were quite a few assistants. There was a large team of them. Some had, you know, come on earlier and left. And I had, um, I got that job because I, in high school, interned at Anonymous Content for Steve Golan. Mm-hmm. And um, he he was producing The Revenant and he and I had stayed in touch. He'd really been a mentor to me for a long time. And and, and he thought I would be good for that job, uh, given how tricky it seemed like it was going. And so I, I flew out there and um, I was in Calgary. So yes, I was on set. I was in Calgary during all of those like crazy snowstorms we've seen and the pictures that you've heard about. And 
I had directed, a few, I had, sorry, I had assisted a few directors prior to that. So I did kind of know the drill, but this was a unique experience for sure. It was, I had to wear essentially like a space suit on set. It was that cold. I had, I remember just buying out the, I, I, I landed and then I had to get to set in the morning. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I didn't know how I could get to set and be on set, like in the clothing I brought. I, I didn't have like a space suit yet. So I remember showing up and I just like looked like a dodo, you know, like I was like wearing everything I owned and everyone else just looked like they really had it down and I just didn't have it down yet. And I'm carrying like Alejandro's lunch and like all of his bags. And I'm just, I just like didn't look cool and I like didn't look ready. So it took me a minute to kind of get into the swing of things, but, um, but I got to see Chivo do all those wonders and I got to see natural light, you know, shooting in natural light. Um, the day is shooting very short, very little light, very, um, because of the winter and it's just like the the conditions we really only had a few hours to shoot each day and it would take like two hours to get to the set so it was a it was a different type of thing than I'd ever done it was also the biggest movie I'd ever worked on it was like 200 million dollars I have no idea it was hundreds of millions of dollars and um the most stress I've ever seen at, at like for I mean the producer I saw some producers like actually just go gray like in front of I was just, like, you know, I mean, I'm sure I, like, I probably aged quite a bit in just that short amount of time, but it was also truly inspiring. Um, you know, so ambitious, but really it, it's an art film and it's, it's gigantic and that's rare, a rare breed. It's insane. insane. Did you, what was like the biggest lesson you learned watching him direct? Did you get a chance to watch him direct? Yeah. And I would say this probably about all of the directors that I've worked for, but I, I mean, specifically Alejandro, just an uncompromising creative vision. Like there, I mean, you've probably heard there was a really big challenge. There wasn't enough snow on the ground for a lot of the, um, toward the end of shooting, wasn't enough snow on the ground. And it wasn't like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll create some fake snow, put it on the ground. And like, that's that. You know, the texture of the snow and the way it read on camera, like if that wasn't as authentic as possible, if that wasn't reading correctly, like we would, you know, we flew somewhere else. Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> fly somewhere else. And it's not, and by the way, it's not just like, you know, you, your DP and a couple of other people on the crew. You're talking about a hundred people plus, <laughs> plus yeah. all the gear in the most insane environment ever trying to. <laughs> Trying to make, I mean, yeah. I heard Leo almost died for God's sakes. I mean, yeah, I, I also remember seeing all of the mock ups of that horse carcass and and just the artistry in the, there's, yeah, so many people building such a universe. And I had, I just had never been on a, a set like that. Like it was really stunning the amount of crafts people and the amount of talent that was that was on that project so obvi obviously so that, same same kind of set as good girl jane right obviously just you know hundreds and, hundreds of people uh on Gigantic. set yeah <laughs> but in shooting for months on end M months on if you didn't like the way the garbage was landing in the back alley you would just go to yeah. another alley yeah yeah definitely <laughs> no i would personally move the garbage <laughs> You know, it's so fun yeah. <laughs> it, it, when you're when you have the ability or, or the opportunity to be on a set like that. It, it's just so remarkable because you're right. It's an art film at a level that no one gets to play in. That's a that's a that's a sandbox that a handful of directors in the world get to play in. Literally a handful of directors in the world. Get so to play. rad. Like, <laughs> let's go. Like, I. Yeah. I mean, it was that was so cool because. I had really, I had worked on art house films. Like that's what I had done for the most part. And this was that, it was just gigantic. Yeah, it was just on such a bigger scale. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm working with Steve Wollen. Uh, you know, this, this is a producer that does 
big uh, movies like yeah but yeah but like but also like michelle gondry films and it Mm -hmm. so it was it was a really unique experience and it is the last movie i assisted on so i really just like i was like okay that i've seen it all i've seen it all (laughs) there's nothing more that can be seen (laughs) <laughs> you're really done, you're done now it's done. i need to move on now this is this is the next this is the next step no it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty remarkable now how did good girl jane come to life like from, a, a, <laughs> from like day one um well i mean I'm, I'm assuming i'm assuming they just threw money at you right because this is obviously oh yeah i, I woke mean, up just, one morning and i was like i'm gonna make i'm gonna make a movie i haven't directed one before and i'm gonna just gonna I'm just gonna find a million bucks and then oh and there it is <laughs> right, right. And there's like, go ahead, just yeah, it just showed up, right? And then you could just start working it the next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what happened. And that's, that's the end what, of the story. And that's the story, and that's the story I'm sticking to. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, so I'm talking to you. I'm in, in uh this living room, this apartment that I'm subletting, and it's um I'm in I'm in Brooklyn and I started this whole process in Brooklyn seven years ago, sorry, in Manhattan, seven years ago. So I, I was, like I said, assisting directors and, um, I finished the revenant and I was like, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a movie. What do I know? You know, that's, that's, they tell you to start there Mm -hmm. after that. So Mm -hmm. it's all, (laughs) I had one option and I was like, um, so I sit down and I start writing and I'm in living New York and I'm like, oh, I can't, I, I I can't actually write this uh, without going home. It like took place in LA. It's like about my childhood. I have to go home. So I moved to LA. I didn't want to live in LA. I wanted to live in New York, but I moved to LA and I wrote the whole thing in my mom's backyard uh, in like a little, truly like a good, like a, storage closet like thing mm-hmm. in her backyard and i wrote it and then i um took me a while and then i sent it to a bunch of like labs and uh, screenwriting competitions and whatnot and got a bunch of rejections like how it goes nobody wanted it uh but but people liked it i think i was like okay i'm not making any progress but it's not but i i can write a little and then um <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and i was like okay the script needs to be better like how do i make it better and um yeah i kept redrafting and i kept sending up places and finally and it's funny because like it wasn't getting in anywhere but then it got into the sundance of writers intensive and I was like, okay, if it's going to get in nowhere and then get in here, like, I'll take it, you know, <laughs> I'll take it. So, so I had a feature script. I brought it there. It was called Junk Food Diary at the time. It was like very like, kind of like punchy and like completely different. I had voiceover like top to bottom. And I got a bunch of notes at, from the Sundance advisors and it threw out the script entirely. And they gave me a little bit of grant money for being in the program. And I m- went and made that, that short film um the mm-hmm. sorry the, the proof of concept short film and i guess we're like three years in at this point i make the short film i um i partner uh to make the short with um this producer and lauren pratt it was her first movie but i had met her while i was assisting directors and i was like i think she's gonna be like a killer producer i'm gonna partner with this girl and so we partnered together she helped me develop the project into um a short and then much bigger and then jake stainer who shot transit with me i brought him on to shoot the short and and then after the short was made again still same as transit it got me some attention like i got a manager off of it and it it played free dance but it had no life on the festival circuit like i would get emails back from programmers like good job but like it didn't play anywhere. The nicest F, the nicest F, FUs ever. <laughs> totally. Like people were engaging to tell me that it was really like affecting or like it really shook them or something. And I'm like, nobody's playing this thing. Like literally nobody's playing it. So um, although no budge put it in like a little, uh, in like a showcase in, in Brooklyn. And I remember that was a fun thing. So I was like, okay, it's playing in the theater. Like it's good. I got it out. But took the short film um, to 
Sundance with uh, just like brought it with me to say my backpack, you know, and um, Lauren and Jake and I, we uh, we paired with um, a sales agency at the time and they put us on a bunch of like speed dating basically with financiers and one of the financiers just so ba- the money. So yeah. back up for a second. <laughs> the speed dating with financiers. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I've uh, never heard of this. Where can I sign up? Where, <laughs> where's the speed dating for financiers I've heard of? This is, okay. this is fantastic. What is that? It's a really, it's a really, a really good question. Well, I'll back up two steps. One is that Sundance put me in one other program, which is called like the, forgive me, it's like the women in film strategy and financing and tech or something. And so they put me in that program with my producer. And that was the first finance year speed dating we did. So we did two. This first, we did two. And this first one, it was, I mean, Lauren and I prepared like as if it was the bar. Like it was insane. And and that sounds probably like really um, crazy of me to say, but it's true. We studied for so long. We had this whole pitch memorized. We were like, it was a whole thing. We, we it was a whole show that we were. We, so we went and we pitched a bunch of people and we got a bunch of meetings, but we didn't get the money. But we did take a bunch of meetings, a bunch of places because of it. And we got sort of out of that a sales agent. And that sales agent, we uh, Lauren and Jake and I, the, the cinematographer, the producer and I, we were like, we're going to go to Sundance and we want to make this. We want to get this movie put together. And the sales agent was like, okay we know some financiers will set you on like two days of meetings. Amazing. And that was what the speed dating was like. That's amazing. I've never heard of yeah. it it's called investor <laughs> speed dating. That is. I, I probably shouldn't call it that then. It, no, but it's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's actually awesome. I've never heard of it that way. And it, it should be, <laughs> there should be more of it. I think we should all have access to speed dating for investors. I think that would be a great company. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's not to say that, like, again, at this point, I'm what, it's like four years in, like, it's right. not so overnight. So overnight is what you're saying overnight. Yeah. Overnight. <laughs> but once we sat down with Astute Films, which is the, the company that um, ended up financing the film, we sat down, I think on day two of the meetings and I pitched them the movie and, and Lauren and I were talking about it and they just agreed to finance it within a few moments of talking. Really? Yeah. And, it and actually- I thought they were kidding. I thought they were kidding. And I thought I was going to like be physically ill because I was so, I was like, I don't want to get excited. You know, I didn't want to. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, like, no, no. Mm-hmm. Up. And I was like, no, I only hear no's. This like can't actually be real. And I remember they took us. Um, I met with Dominique and Simone, who are like uh, two of the producers over there. And they needed to take us to Fred Bernstein, who was the one that was going to like sign the check. And they're like, yeah, we're going to go over to talk to Fred. I was like, I like hadn't, like I, I just like hadn't prepared. I didn't know who this person was. I was so nervous. I was like pinching myself. Like as I was walking over there, like, please just don't like fall over. Just be stupid. Anyway, it was totally fine. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he wanted to make a movie too. So that was- it's, it's, fa- it's fascinating that we as filmmakers constantly are getting no's most no. 99% of the time we get no's. The most no's. The most, the I most. mean, uh, other than actors, the actors get more no's than filmmakers do. That's fair. That that's a fair, fair. That, that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. But uh, in the it, just in the whole process of filmmaking, there's no's all the time. No, 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 no. When someone says yes, and in the way that you just stated it, like so quickly, so like, oh yeah, let's just, let's go ahead. And you're just, this can't. This I was is like, not. absolutely not. Absolutely this is- not. This is- <laughs> Like now I'm now I'm skeptical of you. Like, you know, I was pitching but myself to you, but now that you actually like me and want to make my project, I don't trust you. And it's not because it's like I knew I was going to make this movie because I was going to keep trying to make it till I actually die. You know, I was like, I'm going to make this movie. I'm going to figure it out. But but it was just yeah, it, I was hard. getting a little numb from the nose at that moment in time. At that point, and you're at this point four years in. 
at least, yeah. At least four years in at this point. Yeah. Now, one thing about this project that it when I was when it was pitched to me, it was based on on true life events. So I've seen the movie. And uh, I I was telling you earlier, I'm like, I hope it was very loosely based on real life events because it's a pretty, it's a heavy film. It's a heavy film. And it was based on true events of your own life. So how much of that and how much did you want, want to expose about your own life in your storytelling? I've done something similar. I wrote a book about a horrible experience I had with making a movie for the mafia when I was 26. And that's a whole other it's conversation. It's easy go, right? Writing it's still, about... Yeah route your own life yeah so like you find like for me i always found that like i gotta put it all in i can't hide anything Mm -hmm. and i just let it all out and let it let it hit where it hits because if i start editing it it's just it becomes unauthentic so what how was your experience with it well i'll tweak the language slightly in that it is inspired by my freshman year in high school essentially okay. but so in, i'm sorry that was stop it's all a good. second i <laughs> there are two very large dogs here that i'm i'm hiding from everybody um so my freshman year in high school i did fall in love with a drug dealer and i was addicted to meth and i did have um like this sort of trajectory that we see happen in this film Mm -hmm. um but i it was it was not too challenging to fictionalize the narrative really because even though there's you know many many drops this film but it was like okay well how can i what am i trying to say with this film what i'm trying to do is kind of like what I was talking about earlier with them, like in 2002 when I was speaking in all those movies, I just wanted to offer that, that kind of, that feeling of being seen. I wanted to offer that to the, to the Jane out there, if there are any, because I I was, you know, one of them. And so I was like, okay, it's not so much about like, what is the essence of my experience? Is it like the monotony of the day to day or, or is it the feelings of isolation? and the um, feeling of a lack of intimacy and the loneliness and the shame and the desperation. Like those are the things really that are the truth. And so the people, like the characters that you see in the film, like they're definitely amalgamations of people that I was around that year, but it's all kind of like, like a new puzzle. Uh, that like this the stuff that's that's really jane is is like those those struggles and um that love story is it it tracks pretty closely very very i mean to uh applause for being so honest and authentic with your storytelling and i think honestly that's probably why i got the attention i got is because there is authenticity behind it and you know from someone who's been in the business for a bit you start getting jaded by stories, by movies, by scripts you read. But when you find something that is authentic, it pops for whatever reason. It's, you know, you want to get metaphysical on it, the energy coming off the screen, off the pages. There's something about it that you just, there's something there. And I saw that in the film. I was like, there's something here. I just was like praying, God, I hope it wasn't all this. God bless her. (laughs) I mean, yeah, like it's the, the the timeline of the film is probably is about a year. And this moment in my life was probably it was a little longer than that. Um, mm-hmm. So everything's kind of condensed, of course. Con- yeah, condensed. Um, you know, I'm alive. Hey, so you know what? Good. What doesn't kill us <laughs> makes us stronger. No question about it. Now. Yeah. As a director, we all go through this. Uh, we all understand the insanity that is a set, especially your first movie is even more insane. Uh, and I'm just, like I said, we didn't have uh, revenant money, so there wasn't endless not amounts. Quite. <laughs> not quite. We we didn't have craft ser- revenants craft service budget. Uh, <laughs> not quite. Tra- we didn't even have their travel budget. Uh, yeah. Hop, so, in plane, hop in a plane, fly somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah. There's snow, where's their snow? Antarctica? Let's go. Let's uh, go. 
<laughs> so, so uh, there's always that one day, if not every day, but there's generally one day that's even more extreme that you feel like the entire world's coming down, crashing around you, that you're going to lose the light, you're going to lose your camera, financing drops, the actor can't show up for whatever reason. There's that one oh, day. Yeah. What was that one day for you and how did you overcome it? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So we had two. Okay. Um, first one is so so that so I filmed this <laughs> so this movie was shot over the course of a year. Um, it, we shot we started shooting. I'm gonna mess this date up, but it was like March third, twenty twenty, which is like the best week in the history it's, it's of the a world. Absolutely. To shoot films? Absolutely. It's the best time to start a movie. Yeah. Absolutely. So I like, so like seven years into this process, we like get <laughs> greenlit. I like on the set, you know, 10 days in the film was supposed to be 20 day shoot already like very quick, you know, 10 days in. And there are like whispers of an issue, like a virus. <laughs> anyway, go home after um, Friday. I think fr- it was like Friday, maybe be Friday the 13th, March 13th. Huh? Obviously. Maybe that. Obviously. Yeah, I go home anyway. Wake up on Saturday, and they're like, "We're gonna we're gonna shut down, right?" And I was like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah." This makes sense. <laughs> we're gonna shut down. Yeah, I was like, "That makes sense. Totally, that tracks with the struggle of all of this." And like, let's do it. I mean, we had to keep uh, everyone safe. But like, of course, that was the choice we're gonna make. But it was crazy, and it felt like we might not come back up definitely right no i've had by the way i've had multiple filmmakers on all levels of budgets come on the show that started in march april may and half their movie was made and then it's gone and they just like i don't know if we're in a year later they come back yeah how long did it take you to come back we started shooting the second round of production march 3rd 2021 (laughs) So and literally a whole year, a whole year yeah. of you sitting on half your movie. Yeah. And I'm assuming you're editing maybe some scenes, maybe you're rewriting yeah. some of the script, you're reworking stuff. You just that's all yeah. you could do. But as a filmmaker, psychologically, I can't even imagine just the brutality of that year for you. <laughs> it's a lot of compartmentalizing and like like a lot of uh what is it, like cognitive dissonance. I was just like, we're going back. And that's denial. It. Den- it's called yeah, denial. denial. It's <laughs> denial. That's what it is. I was in denial. I I was just like planning my return. And I, yes, I was editing the film. I was shot listing with Jake constantly, like constantly. We reworked a lot of shots. I rewrote the end of the film. I was texting with my actors, being like, don't forget, you know, like, <laughs> I'm still here. We're making this. Yeah, thing. I'm still here. <laughs> And I was like, don't get a face tattoo. Literally, that's a lot of what I was doing. I was just don't like, get a face tattoo. Don't, don't change your haircut. Face tattoo. Don't, cha- yeah. don't, cha- don't change your haircut. Because I had like, you know, 10, 20 year olds that I was like, <laughs> wrangle <laughs> for a year. Like her, like hurting wet cats, like hurting wet cats. <laughs> yeah, it was a task. Like, yeah. Was so that was the first thing. So that was the first thing. What was the second day? Oh, yeah, right. The second day. So then the second day, uh, and you've seen the film. So um, there are a bunch of shots in in a car. Mm-hmm. The whole half the third of the film is in the car. But there's, um, there's some shots in the car that were processed trailer shots. And... Um, Man, I gotta find you some stills and send them to you. But we had like Revenant style day one day. Like it was a massive rigging team, and Jake was strapped to the top of a vehicle. We had like six cop cars circling. Um, we had, we were on like, I don't know, it was like San Vicente or Wilshire, like a thoroughfare in LA with like six kids in the car. Um, and we, and the rigging took so long that oh, we yeah. have like an hour to hour to get all the, the all the shots that I needed. <laughs> it, took, it takes nine hours to rig in an hour to shoot. <laughs> and then there was a lightning storm. Of course there was. And so my AD came up to me like sweetest, sweetest man. I was just like, 
insurance day, like go home, we go home. Right. And of course, like, we're not going to shoot anything if it's unsafe. A, a, a process trailer is metal. Like, it's all metal. It's, no it's, one can it's be China there. Antenna. It's a China antenna. <laughs> yeah. So we had to track the weather, like, to the second, get people in the car, shoot for, you know, two minutes, get them out of the car, wait till the rain stops, get them back in the car. And we already didn't have enough time. That was a day where I was like, huh. Like, huh. I don't think you this know? is going to go. I don't think I'm going to make yeah. it. You yeah, know? but you made it through, and and the, the thing that's the thing with these kind of things is generally speaking, it works out in some way, shape, or form. But it definitely didn't work out the way you wanted it to. Works out better. Mind. It works out better. It, it always does. It always does. It's just so weird, it really but does. it always when things happen, I just I now just go okay. This is obviously where the universe wants to take us right now. Yes. Let's see what it's happens. It's just true. It's woo woo, but it's true. Like there, it, <laughs> there's it so many we. Like when we shut down, we had one false start. We tried to put the production back together. And, and I got a call from um, our lead actors team. And they were like, he just got booked for six months on a job in, I don't remember where it was, like um, in, in Europe. Sure. And I was like, okay, well, so never getting him back. You know, it's like, there's just, there have been so many, so many times where I've thought, okay, this is the worst day ever. This is the worst case scenario like shutting down for a year. And you know what? It really benefited the movie. It really did. It's a painful way of doing Every time. it. It's a painful way of doing it, but it it does. It does do it. Absolutely. Every time there's ever been a, a complete disaster and anything I've ever done, it generally works out better. Generally almost always works out better. Now, after, after this whole experience, you've, you've made your movie now, you've, You've been around the block, you've been on The Revenant and on True Detective and all these other, you know, all this stuff that you've done over the last decade at this point. Is there something you wish someone would have told you at the beginning of this journey? Hmm. Well, I wish someone had told me sooner that women can have this job. I like didn't, <laughs> I, I wasted a lot of time thinking that because I was an introvert. And I say that like in a very literal way, people say that all the time, but I just like, I'm not a very social person. I'm very shy. I was a, like, I mean, you'll see the movie and it's like, I, I was Jane. I was like, really had a hood on like most, mm -hmm. of, but I was like, okay, that person can still have this job. I did not know that. And obviously someone can't give you permission to like live your destiny. Like no one needed you information, <laughs> but I, I wish I'd seen, you know what? It, it's not so much. I wish someone had told me this is changing, but I wish I'd seen women yeah. directing, seen female directors, seen directors that didn't all just look like one thing. And that would have changed the game a little sooner for me. I was lucky enough that I'm a Latino man and I had not seen any Latino directors growing up. This is, it was just, yeah. I just didn't know anyone. Like, where are they? Where yeah. are they? And then yeah. all of a sudden, Robert Rodriguez showed up. It's mm. El Mariachi mm -hmm. showed up the year that I was in high school thinking about being a director. And I said, yeah. oh, oh, there's there's the one dude. He he did it and he did it in an insane way. OK, this can be done. So you do need That's to see it. You, you need, need to that. see you need to yeah. see other people like yourself doing what you are doing just to give you the confidence to go, if they could do it, then I have a shot to do it as well. And, and, and that is so, so important to be represented out in the world. And, and then sometimes you see these directors who, who were just breaking down doors to get, to be the first to do something um, is, is so um, what's the word? Um, you know, so amazing that they were able to do that uh, and have the grit and the hustle to be able to do that when they didn't have anyone yeah. at all. But I agree with you 100 percent now. Um, and this is coming out on Tribeca, right? You got into Tribeca and that was what was that phone call like? Uh, so I, it was an email and it was it was really funny. I don't remember what. OK, so we got an email from them. Again, after you know some rejection, get an email from them, and um, they asked if we were still available for a world premiere. They hadn't like offered. 
they're like, you still, but this was a very long time ago. It was like, it was in December. I was, I was like, not, not thinking about this festival yet. It was so far away. And we had an email and they were like, is Good Girl Jane still uh, available? And um, so I talked to my producers and I was like, yeah, we're still available. And then uh, I had, like I said, I'd been in the Sundance intensive. So I spoke with the lab people at Sundance and I was like. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, I think like, um, Tribeca might want this film and we were just like talking to them about the festival run the lab people are different from the festival they just sort of like they just give advice and they're just like really the loveliest anyway I was on a call with them just being like help me gu- guide me like how, how does this work and my producer called me and was like actually we got in and we're going <laughs> you know like we just got invited I mean she didn't say we're going but she was like we just got officially invited and like congrats um, this is happening and then, <laughs> This is actually happening. They're not just like a little interested. I think what I was asking the Sundance people is I was like, how do I convince them to take me? Or like, well, and they were just like, if they reached out to you, they they like it. You you know, like. Yeah, festivals don't do that. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, oh, like, do they mean it? I'm just clearly a little skeptical. I was like, do they mean it? Is this real? Um, But no, that they, yeah, they emailed us, they offered us the, the spot. And then the second I spoke with the programmers, I was, it just like, it changed everything. They, they are the perfect home for this movie. Like New York is the perfect home for this movie. Festival is the perfect home for this movie. Uh, this is my favorite city in the world. Like they're, uh, my whole family can come to the screenings. My producer's family can come to the screenings. But like a lot of the cast lives here. It just, it ended up just like, per- it, it's one of those divine things that we were talking about before. Like I didn't know what it, the future was going to look like for this movie or where it was going to play. And I knew it, it really needed to play somewhere. And then it's playing in the right place. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, yeah. what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, well, if you can do anything else, then you're probably trying to do the wrong thing. <laughs> like, if you're like, I want to make movies, um, and if it doesn't work out in a few years, like, I'll go do like social media direction or so I don't know, like creative, a doctor, whatever, anything else, then like, I don't know, it's for you. I don't know. I mean, um, but not to discourage anyway, but. I think that's actually like a fun thing to think about. It's like, if you know, this is like everything and this is 100% what you're, you have to do, then you're going to figure it out because you just won't stop. Very and good. so and that kind of passion and that kind of like true, like that type of dream, that's, that's rare. And if you have it, you have it. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? still learning. <laughs> uh, so I, I spoke like briefly about how this, this movie is about a moment of time in my life that was like very shameful. And I had, it's not that, yeah, I felt a lot of shame at the time of like when I was younger. And when I was pitching this movie a lot, I had to kind of show up in those meetings and pretend that I had no shame or like, you know, act very uh, loving of myself. And it's actually just really okay to be whoever you are. Like this process, making this film has taught me that. I don't know if I knew that going into making it. I I was faking it and then making it, (laughs) making the film has been like, geez, it really is fine to be exactly who you are. Like you don't need to put on all these airs or like pretend to be someone else or right. like, it's going to work out if you're exactly who you are. So that's... I'd, I'd argue that the key to making it work out is to be yourself. It's the only thing that makes you stand apart. 
100%. It's yeah. I mean, all you have is you, you're not going to be like a great version of someone else. <laughs> you're going to be right. only a great version of who you exactly are. But I didn't, I, that took me a long time to figure yeah. out. Oh yeah. Agreed. I know. I, I, you know, I, I I'll never be a great uh, imitation of Tarantino or Rodriguez or Fincher or Nolan or Spielberg because they're good at what they do. And they're pretty much the best at being them. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, but you can only be the best version of yourself. And that's yeah. the key. And what, and I think any, anybody who has any success in any avenue of this, in this life is true to themselves, generally speaking. And it's it, true. And, 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 and this, like this moment of my life that is very dark um, has been the inspiration for the thing that is the most stunning and the most beautiful thing in my life. Like the, like mm -hmm. this, this experience that I had and, and the struggle that I had is like, you know, I, I wrote a movie about it and now <laughs> I'm here. Like, I'm so happy that happened. I'm so happy that, that I'm, that I made it out of it for sure. But I, I don't wish I could like carve some pieces out of me and take some of my history away. And, it's like, what's the use of that? What's the use of that at all? Agreed. You are who you are and whatever happened to you in your past is what made you who you are today. And I've, I came to grips with that a long, long, long time ago. Just like if I had to do it over again, I would go the same way because that's who I am. And if you take that away, you take a big chunk of who you are away. Uh, and you wouldn't have been able to make this movie. You wouldn't no. have, you wouldn't have done any of this stuff. So where would you have gone? It, it might've been a different world. Might have been better, yeah. might have been worse. Who knows? But this is the path that you were put on and it, it, embrace it without question. And last question. Yeah. Three of your favorite films of all time. Should have prepared for that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, each of my all time is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, Fish Tank, Andrea Arnold. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, but I'm going to say Reprise, Joachim Trier. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked with Joachim on a lot of the bombs and he is brilliant, brilliant director. So yeah. him. uh, yeah. really, really anything that you check. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I, Sarah, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's been an absolute joy talking to you. It's it, your energy is, is infectious for what you're doing. So, uh, thank you for thank coming you so on much. the show. This is so hey. fun. And congrats on all your success so far. And I know you're going to do a lot of amazing things and tell some really remarkable stories in the future. So continued success. And hopefully there's a little girl out there who's going to see this and go, if she could do it and if he could do it, I mean, I got a shot. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's what this is all about. That's what this is all about for me, for sure. But I appreciate you, my dear. Continue success. Thank you so much. I want to thank Sarah so much for coming on the show and sharing her journey with the tribe. Thank you so, so much, Sarah. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 206. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. If you love the show, guys, please share it, talk about it, share it with all your friends. I want this information to get out there as much as possible on YouTube, on the podcast, on Apple, on Spotify, wherever you watch or listen to this. Please share it with as many people as possible. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 